as always, we got to remind you about our friends at Bet Online. They bring you all this great content here on Southeastern 16. And Bet Online is your number one source for all of your sports betting needs this season from baseball, golf, soccer, right to all the top fights in UFC, MMA, and boxing. Every stat, every matchup, and even live odds and spreads while the games are being played. When the game's over, head on over to the online casino. Get in on a game of blackjack or poker. Unwind with one of the over 150 slots games. Head over to the website today to get in on the action. Use promo code BELIEVE, that is B-L-E-A-V, for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online. The game starts here. We've been talking Texas and Oklahoma here on the show already today, but we're going to dive into uh, that topic and, and some more SEC football talk. Brad Crawford with 24-7 Sports joining us. Brad, appreciate you coming on and talking some SEC football with us today. No problem, fellas. Middle of the off season for me. We've got about one more month before my schedule really kicks into extremely high gear. No, no days off from August 1 to, well, now late January with the 12-team expansion. Yeah, for sure, and uh, we are recording this on Monday, July 1st, big day, Texas and Oklahoma officially into the SEC. There's been so much talk really since uh, the, since the rumors started, since the announcement has been made, and, and now they're officially in, and, and, and you wrote a piece on 24-7 Sports that I thought was really great on the two teams and their entrance into the conference, but just for you, what do you, what do you make of this? What does Texas and Oklahoma – with all the history that they have, what do they bring to the conference to make it better? Yeah, I think, you know, a conference that has already established itself as college football's superpower just in front of the Big Ten, I think, now has added two blue bloods who have countless All-Americans, national titles, NFL draft picks, two respected coaches now in Steve Sarkeesian and Brent Venables. Neither of those guys have won a national title yet, but I do think that'll happen down the road here in the SEC. Like I said, man, it, it really strengthens what I see as college football superpower. The SEC has won uh, four straight national championships prior to Michigan going 15-0 and last year. So itching to get back to the top now is the SEC, and they've added two of college football's winning as programs in doing so. Brad, sometimes you see situations like this where the league makes the teams joining it stronger or situations sure. where the league like this – breaks those teams because let's face it, it doesn't get a lot tougher than week in and week out in the sec give me give me just kind of a quick case of make or break for both those programs yeah i think texas right now is in slightly better position than ou just based on roster talent coaching staff uh, even 2024 schedule just talking about this season i mean oklahoma faces arguably the nation's toughest schedule outside of the state of florida i mean, I mean you know the gators play I think 11 Power 5 conference schools, crazy for Blue Napier. But OU has to host Tennessee in their SEC opener. They play Tulane, a G5 program that could make the playoff as the G5 rep. They go to Auburn, Red River against Texas, at Ole Miss. I mean, it's a, it's a tough schedule for Oklahoma. And, and Brent Venables right now I don't think has the roster to endure that kind of brutal week-to-week -week stretch. On the other hand, Texas certainly does. Um, a top three talent-wise roster in college football, when you kind of reference the two deep, best best quarterback room in college football, talking about obviously Quinn Ewers, a returning All-Big 12 quarterback from last season, and Arch Manning, a guy who's going to try to fight for snaps this season behind Ewers. You know, Paul Feinbaum said this week he expects Arch Manning to be Texas starter yeah. by the middle of the season. I don't, I don't know about that, barring an injury from Quinn Ewers, but – I do think Steve Sarkeesian right now is in better position to have early success in the SEC compared to Brent Venables at OU. Do you think if if last year had not have happened for Texas, you go to Tuscaloosa, you beat Alabama, you you end up making the college football playoff and and very well could have won that game and gotten to the national championship, would we be having a different conversation right now if if, if last year not hap had happened for Texas? Would there would there be less excitement around this? You think? Definitely so. I mean, the SEC couldn't be happier with what happened for Texas last season as far as getting to the playoff, really being one completion in the corner of the end zone away from making the playoff title game. And, you know, I was one of these guys last summer that took Texas to make the playoff. I had them winning the Big 12. I got some heat for that. And I think Texas right now is even better team in 2024 than they will be in 2023. I don't you know, I don't think the doldrums of the SEC schedule and, and brutality of that slate is going to 
affect the Longhorns this season like it will down the road is if, you know, Sark can't continue to sign these top five classes. But obviously Texas right now is a sexy pick to make the playoff and the SEC couldn't be happier with what the Longhorns bring to the table. Brad, Oklahoma is kind of at an interesting point in its football life, I guess, joining the SEC one, but you got Brent Venables defensive guy at a place where offenses and, and not that you can't have a defensive coach put up great offensive numbers, but Oklahoma over the last 20 years has scored about as many points as anybody in college football. What, sure. what do you make of Oklahoma's identity going forward, being led by a defensive coach at a program where the bread has been buttered more on the offensive side? Yeah, I think it needs to be, at least in the early going, transfer portal heavy, sort of the way Lane Kiffin has built up Ole Miss very quickly. Now Ole Miss is a preseason, in my estimation, top five team. I think OU can get to that point uh, faster if they – you know, focus a little bit more on portal recruiting. I think they had the number eight class two cycles ago, just inside our top 20 this cycle. Probably not going to cut it if you want to make the playoff. They replaced four starters on the offensive line. You mentioned how, you know, Venables is kind of a defense first guy. He's also somebody who wants to run the ball between the tackles. And when OU is really good, they've got a Heisman type quarterback and they've got, you know, a two or three running back stable back there that can really pound the football. Uh, Gavin Salchuk's a guy who should have maybe 900 yards, 1,000 yards season in the SEC this fall. But like I said, it's behind a brand new offensive line. And you also lost your starting quarterback, Dylan Gabriel, to Oregon in the portal. And Jackson Arnold, former five star signee, we've only seen one start from him. He started last year's bowl game against Arizona. So I'm looking forward to seeing if uh, he can contend with some of these, you know, top end SEC secondaries. You mentioned a minute ago when you're talking about their schedule, the Red River rivalry, Texas and Oklahoma. You now add that to another great rivalry in the SEC. I mean, that that now has to be up there as one of the, the best rivalries in the conference. I mean, obviously, we have some great wins in the SEC, but adding that, I mean, that's that's another mid, kind of midseason rivalry game we get to experience. It certainly does, man. Adding that to the third Saturday in October, Bama, Tennessee, you've got, you know, uh, Georgia, Florida, Georgia, Auburn. Um, even LSU, Florida now, to an extent, those, those two teams hate each other when they had that cross-divisional game. So now that we have no divisions, you know, you're going to see some of these SEC uh, protected rivalries is, is what they call them. We're going to still see those being played. Um, you know, I'm I'm kind of in South Carolina country down here in the Carolinas, and this is the first time the Gamecocks haven't played Florida, Tennessee, or Georgia on the schedule and since they entered the SEC. So – You're going to see some scheduling quirks, I think. But for the most part, some of these big name rivalries, especially Red River now moving forward, we should see those games played annually. Well, Brad, you you left one rivalry out, and and there's a lot of them. Iron Bowl. (laughs) Well, (laughs) there's that one. But uh, I was thinking more Texas, Texas A&M, because I don't know how much you follow baseball, but the, the, the whole situation went down this week with, Texas taking A&M's baseball coach and all kinds of yeah. stuff allegedly going on behind the scenes. How does that change the rivalry, that dynamic, plus these two being in the same league now? Yeah, I took some flack a few months ago when I I took Texas 11-1 regular season, the lone loss coming in College Station there at the uh, end of November. That, that'll be a wild uh, wild affair at Kyle Field. I'm I'm looking forward to, man, to, to seeing that rivalry. Obviously, it's a game that had been played in I think more than 10 seasons, which is just crazy considering, you know, those, those two rabid fan bases and how much they hate each other. Uh, you know, one more rivalry game that I think that we're going to see kind of turn into one down the stretch the next five to 10 years is Texas, Georgia. Those are two teams. Yeah. I think Texas is trying to supplant Alabama, you know, in that elite tier. Obviously we're going to see kind of a wait and see approach with, with uh, Caleb DeBoer, but Texas, Georgia is a game that it, if we see it played annually, whether it's in the regular season in Atlanta or in the playoff, that should be a game that garners, you know, ample attention. Yeah, and uh, that, that's for sure. And and we could talk Texas and Oklahoma for a while, but I want to get your thoughts on some other SEC programs. And you mentioned Kalen DeBoer a second ago. I wanted to get your thoughts on Alabama just because, I mean, we haven't seen this much change at Alabama in the last 17 seasons. And we, we know right. what happened under Nick Saban. Now you got a, a coach in Kalen DeBoer who's won a lot of football games. 
Do you think that translates to Alabama? How does it go in year one in Tuscaloosa? Yeah, man, I've, I've I've been on the fence about taking Alabama to, you know, be one of my four teams in the SEC's uh, playoff distinction. I mean, it's, it's been tough for me between Georgia, Texas, and Ole Miss. I think those three teams are going to be playoff locks this season. And that fourth team, man, is either Alabama, LSU, maybe Missouri, maybe Tennessee. Um, I'm a big fan of Jalen Milrow. I think he takes that next step in his development. Alabama did lose some key guys on defense. Dallas Turner, they don't have an edge guy right now as good as him. Deontay Lawson can obviously be that guy. And then, you know, watching Bama's spring game, I know we can't take too many strong takeaways from that, but I don't see a wide receiver one right now on that roster. And that's something that we haven't been able to say, you know, in a decade plus at Bama. They, they've had some dogs at that position. So I, I need to see more playmakers around Milrow before I'm ready to put Bama you know, maybe 10 and two, 11 and one. But I mean, DeBoer's a guy, if there's one thing he knows, it's how to produce yardage and points. So I do think with the talent in Tuscaloosa, he should have a pretty good first season. Yeah, that's funny that you mentioned that because we talked about that on last week's show. The the, the names there for Alabama, it's not the, the running back room with Derrick Henry and and Mark Ingram or the receiver room of 2020 with just names for days. I'm interested in that too. But the question I want to ask you, Brad, Auburn, um, when, when things are going well at Alabama, you better be doing pretty close to as well at Auburn or, or patience runs out quickly. And, and Hugh Freeze was kind of uninspiring in year one. I have some I questions agree. about the, the quarterback room year two. They got the receiver room better. But I, I'm very interested to see how this one goes because there was some feeling at Ole Miss when he left that maybe the magic had started to run out a little bit there. Your thoughts? Yeah, on the wide, yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the wide receiver room is certainly fixed. You know, you signed five-star Cam Coleman. He's a guy who is going to be an instant impact player in the SEC. But can Peyton Thorne get him the football is my, my biggest question. I mean, I was shocked that Hugh Freeze and Auburn and those boosters there, whoever runs the NIL on the Plains, mm -hmm. did not sign a portal quarterback this spring. I just assumed that, you know, Auburn was going to get one of those top-end guys, maybe Cam Ward maybe convince Liberty quarterback Caden Salter to, you know, come to Jordan Hare. Didn't didn't happen. And they're moving forward with Peyton Thorne as a starting quarterback. So I do think he is a weak link on offense. Obviously, they should be pretty good defensively. I think they have seven starters back. Offensive line looks pretty good. But like you said, I mean, patience is going to wear thin if they, you know, finish six and six, seven and five, and then lay an egg for a second straight year during bowl season. I mean, I know Hugh Freeze said we were out recruiting – before that Maryland game last year, and we didn't care. But, well, yeah, you also lost to New Mexico State, and you gave up a fourth and 31 completion, you know, from Milrow to Bond in the back corner to lose the Iron Bowl. That, that's three big losses for Freeze that, you know, he hadn't been able to overcome yet. So uh, 2024 is not a contract year for Hugh Freeze, but it's going to be really ugly if, you know, Auburn goes 500 heading into that third season. The LSU Tigers, you mentioned LSU a second ago as, as one of those kind of borderline uh, playoff teams. Offense last year, phenomenal. Defense, kind of the opposite. Um, if if they change some things up on defense, which which we know they have, you know, some some personnel, some coaches, we'll see how it translates to the field. But uh, is is that kind of what hangs on whether they're in the playoffs or not, in your opinion, just how the defense is? Yeah, I think getting Bo Davis, the D-line coach from Texas, was a you know masterful move from Brian Kelly. And then he swipes Missouri's top coach and Blake Baker to call his defense. The issue for me right now at LSU is uh, they don't have the personnel on that side of the football to, to go 11-1 outside of Harold Perkins. And he can't play all 11 positions. And right now he's sort of playing out of position at outside linebacker. I, I think Perkins is a, a rush edge and he'll probably play – kind of a hybrid type role this fall uh, in Baton Rouge. But obviously the even there's there's questions on, on the other side of the ball too. You know, Garrett Nussmeyer, we know he's a strong backup quarterback, but now he's in that starting role having served as the, you know, QB2 behind Jaden Daniels. They lost two first-round wideouts. Uh, they're expecting a lot out of the Liberty transfer. C.J. Daniels had an excellent spring. And then Kyron Lacey, he's a wide receiver who – has been on campus several years, but hasn't had that breakout campaign, you know, that they really wanted to see. And then the backfield, there's some questions there too. So I don't, I don't have LSU right now as a, you know, team that can withstand this schedule and and get to the playoff. 
but they're certainly in that, you know, second tier mix behind Georgia, Texas, and Ole Miss that, you know, that game against Alabama in November, fellas, that might determine that fourth SEC playoff team. Brad, this really hadn't occurred to me until I started really diving into the roster. Are people sleeping on Florida a little bit? I know all the talk has been on the hot seat right. and, and the schedule. And look, I, I think they have got a tough climb. You talk about toughest schedules in the country. Uh, find me one tougher than Florida, and that makes an interesting debate. But, I mean, they've got some dudes. Graham Mertz had a nice year. They got Eugene Wilson. They got Montreal Johnson, who's had a nice career. They've got some offensive linemen with some experience. Any way they can kind of outrun the, the schedule and maybe surprise a little bit? Yeah, could you ask me that question after the Miami opener? I mean, that's that's you. <laughs> yeah, good call. <laughs> you know, if if they're able to beat Miami in Gainesville, you know, Billy Napier kind of off the hot seat, so to speak, after week one, maybe this season for the uh, Florida, you know, changes considerably because they they've got some winnable games after that. But I know you guys have seen the last five weeks. I mean, I don't, I, I don't have it in front of me, but it's LSU, Ole Miss. I mean, it's very, very tough. And, and then you, you close against Florida State. You also play UCF in September. They've got former, you know, Hall quarterback KJ Jefferson and Malzahn run that offense. So it, it's a, it's a tough schedule. But, but Graham Mertz, former Wisconsin quarterback, he had a much better first season at Florida than I thought he was going to have last fall. And obviously Eugene Wilson, he'll be a sophomore now. He was an all all freshman team, all American guy for us last year. So they have some playmakers back on offense, but losing Princely to Ole Miss on defense, losing Travis Etienne, uh Trevor, excuse me, to uh, you know, um Georgia, that's that's two big losses. And I think the schedule, Florida could be six and six and be a very good six and six, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I want to ask you about Georgia. Obviously, going into the season, uh, folks say you know they they could be back at the top. You know, when we're, when we're having this conversation next year, uh, what is it uh, about this team? Is there any concerns? I know you 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 look at the wide receiver room, a lot of new guys to to play with Carson Beck, but do you see any problems with this team? My concern with Georgia is you know they they lost two draft picks on the O line. Obviously, the three returning starters are very good. Uh, all conference caliber players, but getting through that schedule might be tough for Kirby Smart. He's won 39 straight games in the regular season, but this is by far the toughest schedule he's had to face while in Athens. You know, they they play three top 10 teams uh, on the road, and that that game at Ole Miss in November, I think, is a possible payback game for Lane Kiffin. He said after last year's game in Athens that we have to sign better guys at the line of scrimmage. Well, he went out and got, you know, Walter Nolan, and he got Florida's best defensive player in Princely. So uh, I do think Georgia's regular season win streak comes to an end this fall, but I wouldn't take anybody right now outside the Bulldogs to win the SEC uh, right now. I, I think that Georgia was a playoff team last season, should have been a playoff team, and losing by three points in Atlanta still still hurts. You know, they, they took the frustrations out beating Florida State by – what, 10 touchdowns, I think it was, 60 points down in Miami. But this is still a team that I, I think is hungry, very good quarterback in Carson Beck. And, you know, I don't really see any personnel issues to uh, have me leave Georgia out of that 12-team playoff mix. My apologies in advance for, for the length of the question, but I don't know how else to set it up. Um, you've had for the last 20 years, and, and in between you've had LSU and, and Auburn win a national title. But you've had – you go back to Urban Meyer. Florida was the dominant team for a few years. And then Nick Saban did it for a decade. And it felt like nobody was going to knock them off. Then Kirby Smart came in and did it for a few years. And then you have last year when you have Georgia and Ohio State both ranked number one in the playoff in November. Neither of them made it. And, and I, I thought the parity at the top was more than it's been in a while. Is that going to be the norm going forward where we don't have a Georgia or an Alabama that just dominates for a four-year cycle? feels like the forces of NIL and all these things have just combined to where it's going to be a lot more like the NFL to me than it was the college football we've been used to. That would be great for SEC football fans, and and I think you're on to something there. But I, I'd, I'd probably, you know, put the uh, – stop the bill somewhere in the middle of the conference, maybe at the seven or eight team range, 
that will compete, you know, for the next 10 years. I think the Mississippi States, the South Carolinas, the the Vanderbilts, the Kentuckys, even even Missouri, once Brady Cook and Luther Burden leave, those schools are going to have a really tough time in this new SEC because Texas and OU aren't going anywhere. Kirby Smart's going to sign a top three class until he finally quits down the road in Athens. And unless some of these, you know, top end coaches in the SEC leave for NFL jobs in the foreseeable future, I think we're going to see half of the SEC kind of separate itself from the other half of the league. Um, and, you know, a, a, a colleague of mine, Buddy Elliott, always says that half the SEC takes a check every year and the other half is actually competing for a championship. And I'd, I couldn't agree more with that. I mean, there's, there's a bottom tier that is just not going to sign enough elite recruiting classes to compete with the Georgias, the Bamas, the LSUs, the Oklahomas every week. Good stuff there. Brad Crawford, you can check out his uh, work there at 247sports.com. You can follow him on Twitter at bcrawford247. Brad, really appreciate you taking some time with us, talking some SEC football. We'll have to do it again soon, but thanks for your time today. Thanks a lot, fellas.